Hey guys, this is Joel, and you're watching my podcast, Party Like a Rockstar. If you haven't watched any of the episodes yet, it's cool. My background is I was a roadie for bands like Guns N' Roses, Stone Temple Pilots, The Cranberries, and Poison. I wrote a book called Memoir of a Roadie. It was the number one new release on Amazon and Bios, and it's done 3 million copies on Kindle. It's been a lot of fun. This episode's a cool one. I got a couple drummers for you. The first one is my old buddy Ryan Hoyle. Been friends with him a really long time. Ryan was the drummer for Paul Rogers from Bad Company and also the drummer of Collective Soul from 2005 to 2008. Ryan's actually now running his own studio where you can go record with Ryan. Kind of a no-brainer if you're interested in making music. If you want to get a hold of him, go to LiveDrumTracks.com and Ryan himself will answer you. My second guest is his buddy, Jason Sutter. Jason Sutter is also a well-known drummer. He's worked for Marilyn Manson, Smash Mouth, the New York Dolls, Chris Cornell, Joe Perry, Foreigner, Ben Lee, Vertical Horizon, the Rembrandts, Joel Walsh, and Robert and Dean DeLeo. Before I even started the interview, we talked for, well, a little while. <laughs> Maybe a long while. <laughs> but I pulled two excerpts from that talk that I think you guys will dig. Check them out. It's Basquiat, right? Uh, yeah, it's actually, uh, it's a weird, it's, it's from a record cover from one of the, he only did two record covers and that's actually a band called the offs. Um, cool. yeah, it's a really rare Basquiat. Um, I know a dude who, you know, basically that, that, that camp is really tight. You know, his family is really tight with releasing prints and a guy bought the record label, the punk New York record label that owned that record that came out in 1984 was some like, it's actually a good record. The record sell for like thousands of dollars. And huh. that dude died of, he died of heroin, the singer of the offs, like three months after the record came out. But Basquiat was a huge fan and did the record. And uh, this guy got the rights to be able to, to release a limited amount of prints because he bought the actual record label. And with that came the rights to the art, which is super rare. So I knew the guy who was in Venice and he made he printed 80 of these and they actually sell it museums with his retrospect right now this show so cool random but rock and roll you know i actually the couch over here was a was a housewarming gift from robert delia oh dude that's cool yeah uh, it's it was an oh, old that's right yeah, i was gonna he, ask you about it you played with robert I work with Robert and Dean. I just played on Dean's new record, actually, which is a really cool record. But those guys, I, I ended up when they went into vent, they ventured into like producing bands. I was in the band that was on Maverick and they produced our record and we became really close and they were just getting really busy to pr producing. And they said, we're going to need a drummer because then they can come in and like, you know, they could come in and work with like Peter Frampton or Joe Walsh. And even if it was just writing they wanted to be able to be like a package and they needed a drummer. So they said, Hey, we, we dig you and your style. Will you be our drum, you know, drummer guy for our production shit. So I got to work with Joe Walsh and Peter Frampton, but we basically, they basically became like, you know, they're, they're, I don't know how your reaction to those two, but those brothers to me are like the coolest fucking dudes. I mean, they should have a podcast. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, I, I ran it. I went to see cheap trick in, uh, at, at in Ventura at the uh at the Ventura Fair and there was, and I ran into Dean like a couple like a couple months ago. It's pretty cute. He's a good know. dude. He's Just, such a good guitar player yeah. too. But I would tell people oh yeah they're... every STP song is a Zeppelin song. And if he's in the mood, he'll sit there and start playing Zeppelin and totally transition into STP the same. And it's such a neat thing to see as he does it because he looks at you Robert, and he'll people smile. Forget. People forget, and Robert Dean will say Robert's a better guitarist than Dean. Is. You know, Dean will say Robert's better than I am. He taught me what I know, and Robert will come over. Robert, he's come over, and he'll literally you can put on like hemispheres, and he'll pick up an acoustic guitar and play every fucking note on Rush hemispheres. Absolutely. So his very first concert when he was a kid was Rush. Oh, yeah, Robert. I believe it. Yeah, very. No, I remember Robert telling me a story that for Dean that Dean had tickets to see Kiss at Madison Square Garden in like '77 or something, and he went out late and got in trouble. Came home drunk and got in trouble, and so he had to give Robert his ticket, and Robert got to go see uh, <laughs> Kiss. And years later, 
he went with, he was like the young kid who went with Dean because Dean's like 10 years older than Robert or eight years older. So he went with the older dude. So there was a little Robert and they got to see Kiss. And years later, when they were playing Madison Square Garden, um, the same two dudes were there and, and that he went with. And like, you know, you know, we're like, hey, dude, remember we saw Kiss? They like yelled out like from the side, you know, it was like pretty so fucking cool. classic. There you go. Those were the excerpts. Hopefully a bit of fun. Let's get into the interview. My first question is going to be here to Ryan. And my mm. question is going to be, would you ever be seen dead in a drum line? <laughs> That's a funny question. Um, I actually did audition for the drum line in high school. And um, they put me in the pit. So I never got to march at all. I just watched them while I practiced rudiments kind of on the grass on the side, you know, the fake grass. Yeah. And so I, I felt like I got a win there because they were dancing around and doing choreography and I got to practice rudiments. So would I ever be caught dead in a drum line? I don't know if I was dead, I wouldn't be able to march. So oh, it's a trick wow. question. Deep thinking. Yeah. So it's really pretty. Now, Jason's big drum line, right? He said he had been in drum line. So I was like, I didn't try, to... man. It happened by accident. I came from New upstate New York near the Adirondack Mountains. We oh, beautiful. Had, I put on a drum once a year to play Yankee Doodle Dandy around our like tiny little town. It was a college town in Potsdam, New York. So I would, I would once a year, I would march around. So I had no idea about marking time. I had no idea. I had good rudimental hands, which, you know, Ryan does as well, but I didn't have that at all. I went to, I, I went literally from that to university of North Texas, which Ryan also attended, which is like arguably any drum line. Now the blueprint was North Texas. Okay. In the early oh, so, 80s. Uh, Eddie told me though, that you, uh, Miami, I ended up I ended up going to North Texas, playing every instrument in the drum line from cymbals to snare drum. And then from there, I ended up getting an assistantship at University of Miami, like the Canes. Rohan Marley was was one of the like, you know, linebackers. Uh, it was back when Miami was like the golden era. It was, this is 1992. Yeah. And uh I ended up, my job was, I, my assistantship was to run the like 40 piece University of Miami hurricane drum line. And really? that was, that was, so I went from like literally not knowing how to do this shit at all to like literally being the instructor for two years and getting paid to go to University of Miami in the sports department. So my joke is that I have a football scholarship because basically <laughs> I literally, I never missed, same at North Texas. I had a scholarship in North Texas. I never missed a football game. So I won't, I never need to see another football game for as long as I, you know. Never yeah, what again. Eddie said was unique about you is he said that you knew tuning like so well. And he's like, it's it's actually crazy. Most drummers suck at tuning. And he goes, Jason is so good. Interesting. So like, I, you know, I'm obsessed. I'm obsessed. You know, yeah, I'm me obsessed too. With it. You yeah, are? Ryan, Ryan, Ryan is definitely way more obsessive than I. Ryan's into like you. He, Ryan's into like wing nuts on cymbals for the vibration, or like you know, like the brass rims, or like shit that they're way. You sh you're the dude. You're, they don't care about that crap in Texas, Ryan. You're gonna have to switch up. I yeah. know, but I do have a little drumline comment that's kind of a job drop. Oh yeah, we got. Sutter. Well, I've been working on that show, Stranger Things, and so they hired me for season four to recreate all their high school drumline parts. Okay. Uh, for the for the show. And I don't have any of the equipment. I don't have tenor drums and marching snare drums and things. So I was just trying to kind of like make it work. And I remember at one point, Sutter, you reminded me of this when you said you played cymbals. I took like two 20 inch crash cymbals and I'm trying to do this like part where psh, 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 with muting and everything. Yeah. And I didn't have the handles. I didn't have any, I, I don't know where I put the little <laughs> leather handles. So I grabbed two hi-hat clutches. Nice. And I, and I'm grabbing them like this and I'm trying to do this. And so the producers on the, or my engineers on the talk back and he goes, dude, can you do that again? And I'm like, I think I'm bleeding. And he goes, well, yeah. let's just stop there. Let's stop yes. there. I'm like, my hands are totally bleeding. And so I, yeah. you reminded me of that. That's funny. Yeah. No, I mean, I never, I never intended to do anything. So it's funny that you're mentioning the drum line thing, but maybe you're kind of connecting the dots, but yeah, it's, it was a, it's a pretty bizarre little world, but I, I've literally gone so far away from that, but it is wild sometimes when I remember, oh shit, I'm actually, that's, I'm like a specialist or was a specialist back in the day in that. And I literally, I, I don't go near, I don't go near it at all, but uh, yeah, it was a wild time, but uh, it's fascinating. One I was totally intrigued by was Bonzo Bash. And uh, he was telling me, it sounded like straight mayhem. So how long did you do that for? 
Well, I did like I did like seven of them. And the coolest thing about that was, you know, Brian Tushy, I think, brought that, oh. up, you know, and the coolest thing about that, I think, is that you got to see there was one drum set. Well, you didn't change the cymbals. You didn't change the tuning. You literally had a minute to get up and play one song. The band was the same. So it was kind of fascinating to watch Chad Smith or Abe Laboreal Jr. or me or Tishy and different dudes get up and play on this one kit. It was really fascinating kind of a kind of experiment to see how much different everyone sounded and how different that drum set sounded from guy to guy. So that was cool. The other cool thing about that for me is Suddenly I'm playing in this, in this venue with, and I had a couple of gigs under my belt, but I was not, you know, I'm playing, Chad Smith is here and, uh, you know, he, he said what on, he would like, have to know. do for you. you. He's like, dude, he, I would start breaking down the drum kit while Jason was still playing. So I could get to the next gig with Jason. He's like, you don't understand. The guy worked so hard. He was in so many bands. It was crazy. I guess there was a time, but like maybe yeah i guess but i mean at the end of the day it was it was great a great way to get exposure you know you go to nam and they started having them at nam or like they'd have them in la right before nam and it used to be you'd go and you'd, you'd go and you'd run into these guys and they were say ludwig artists or something and they'd be like oh hey cool how are you and then once you got to play in front of these guys it was a whole different dialogue you know yeah. you would have these guys suddenly you, you'd be in an elevator or you, you'd be at a signing at nam and now or now they knew who you were so it was a great way for me to get exposure and honestly marilyn manson um he he basically checked out uh part of what got me in the audition was a bonzo bash video you know that's one of the what? things that manson said all right well you're this guy so you know it actually served a, a multi-purpose you know uh exposure as well as like a calling card was Rocco Reedy the stage manager of Manson when you were on Manson? No, I don't okay. know. Okay, so I got, I got a Rocco Reedy question for you guys. This guy is a big stage manager. He's a great guy. He's an old uh, one of the older roadies. Hopefully. But the question he had me ask, and it was great. I asked Davy Johnstone uh, it, and um, he had a killer answer. But who's the most interesting guy or the most interesting person you guys have met who's not a rock star? Oh, boy. Huh. Yeah, that's a oof. it's a good one. So Davies was Princess Margaret, and the story was really, really good. But who's the most interesting? Well, I got to meet Regis Philbin and talk about a guy that's just pure showbiz. And I almost missed the Regis and Kelly show when I played on it, which was really frightening. I got hung up in the Marriott Marquis elevator system oh, no. and missed I missed the van. And I was freaking out. And so they're on the way and I'm like having to try to get a cab. Finally got there. And so we, we met Regis and he was like, can I get you a vodka? And this is like early, early in the morning. And so, <laughs> but talk about a guy that can tell stories, you know, it was, oh, it was pretty God. fun. I just pulled that out, Sutter. What, what, what do you got? I mean, for me, I, you know, it's really tough. And I don't know, this dude is kind of a rock star, but like somehow by accident, actually I met waiting for a bathroom after a show was Henry Diltz, the photographer who shot like Morrison Hotel um, and Crosby, Stills and Nash on the couch and, you know, countless other great. And, and Henry, I met him literally waiting at a bathroom at a restaurant in Hollywood after a, a Morrison Hotel, which is his gallery show, a bunch of get the foot, you know, photographers from Jim Marshall to Niels Lozauer to you name it, you know, Ross Halfin. And uh, I happened to go to the after party restaurant with a, my date and I'm waiting uh, at the restroom and Henry walks up and he's like, Hey man, is this the bathroom line? And I was like, yeah. And I went on to like, you know, tell him how I'm a big fan. And next thing you know, by the time we're done, we've set up a photo shoot that he's going to shoot at my house. But he, the stuff that comes out of his mouth, you know, is just this dude is a photographer, but obviously he's been everywhere. And he's just so, he's like a wizard of rock and roll. And, you know, he's just one of those dudes who I'll be at some crazy party and I'll be talking to like this, you know, top, I met years ago is now one of the top playboy photographers who's hip, you know, maybe a few years older than me and um, kind of tried and true. And we're hanging out at some private party for, uh, uh, I forget the magazine, but it's a cool magazine at, at, at like one of the Getty's houses, you know, in the hills. And, and we're hanging out and I hear like, you know, I'm talking to this guy and all of a sudden I hear like, hey, Jason, and in, in like a full white suit holding a glass of champagne barefooted off in the distance is Henry Diltz getting closer. And this like A-list photographer is just like 
holy shit, is that Henry <laughs> Dilts like losing his mind? And Henry's just like, you know, and Henry's 82 and still like the life of the party. He's still like the guy who'll stay latest at the bar. Um, he'll have as many drinks as you do. Um, not that he's a big drinker, but like the dude is still like nonstop and, and every word out of his mouth is fantastic. So I guess I would have to say that guy, cause I don't think he's actually could be considered a rock star, even though he was in a, in a folk band back in the sixties. I think that's rock affiliated. <laughs> yeah, rock exactly. Affiliated. I mean, bona fide, you know, yeah, to the top yeah. level, you know, I so, did yeah. get asked to sit at a table with Hugh Hefner. Uh, that was pretty cool. That's neat. What did you guys talk about? Not much. <laughs> <laughs> I was I was shocked. <laughs> yeah. He's like, can you pass the pineapple juice? I don't know. That's, yeah. That, probably bad. That's, probably bad. It that's was a Mardi Gras. It's like, I regret not getting to go to that house or get to do that hang because I was around and I could have, you know, I could have done it, but I was so busy. I got invited to like three or four of those, you know, the midsummer nights thing you know and i had an invite and i was in like spain and i you know this was you know this was you know 2007 he was still kicking those parties were still going off oh, and yeah. i had an in and i and every time i got an invite i was just miles away and it's heartbreaking because i love that hollywood ethos and 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 what he brought to the table yeah. and all that vibe and all those great old photos of like james khan and you know kareem abdul jabbar or whatever shit you know i love that and i thought god wouldn't it be cool to make one of those parties while this cat is still around and i never got to do that you know it's just fascinating well, the house was bought by some greek billionaire and his for his son and i believe it and they've been ripping the place apart they renovated the whole thing yeah, it's too bad. I mean, somebody should have bought that place and not changed a thing. Well, know? that was the deal. He didn't want anything changed. He liked, I think it was all early 80s, and he wanted it that way. He didn't want anything updated. He liked it. Have yeah. 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 It might have been seven. But, no. but yeah, that's the, one of the ones that got away. I, I just so wish I could have gone and, like, experienced that vibe of the Playboy Mansion. You know, what a mm -hmm. Hollywood, you know, legend. It was yeah. interesting, Sutter. They, uh, I went to a Mardi Gras party there, and you can't drive. You have to catch a shuttle somewhere on Wilshire. I believe it. And they, they shuttle you in like you're not allowed to know where it's at. And yeah. <laughs> it's pretty disorienting. <laughs> and then you get there, and you pull up to the little you know circular roundabout thing, and it's just it's intense. They got the yeah. zoo and the grotto, and the, it's, it's something else. Dude, I'm jealous. I'm just so uh, jealous. <laughs> Um, were your guys' parents musicians or how did you guys get into the fold and were they happy that you got into music or did it take a long time to be happy or? I got an answer for that. Yeah, actually the, how I discovered drums in the first place was, um, I was sneaking around in my dad's closet looking for his rifle because he had left the house and I thought, I know he's got the gun in there somewhere and I just want to see it. You know, I had no devious plans, but I just wanted to check it out. And so I, I found it, I unzipped it. And I'm like, there it is. And I zipped it back up. And meanwhile, somehow I was, you know, uh, messing around and this pair of drumsticks literally fell out of the top shelf, top, top shelf of his closet. Wow. And when he got home, I said, you know, and there was a little wooden Ludwig practice pad up there as well. And when he got were home, they signed I, I by said, Jason Sutter, they were like Jason Sutter drumsticks. <laughs> yeah. It's a signature. Yeah. 1964 Sutter yeah. practice. Yeah. do you remember those center the wood platform i mean these are oh, all really yeah. for our time yeah and so i he got home and i asked him i said dad what are these and he was a drummer in junior high for, for a short period of time he, he he's like where did you find those and i said in your closet and he's like really <laughs> he right showed me that. how to hold he showed me how to hold traditional grip that's how he played and that stuck with me actually that's why i play traditional a lot of the time that's a cool story that's awesome yeah, I mean, for me, I was mine was different, and it does kind of tie in with fine art, which I, you know, we, we talked about before we started this thing. Um, I, my dad was a professor at a at, at a college in uh, called Potsdam State, a state university college, and had a huge art collection. Those state university colleges have incredible art collections, um, and uh, incredible. What galleries. did you teach, a professor of art or? Uh, pretty, yeah, fine art. Yeah. So he taught drawing, sculpture, you know, there was a foundry, you could pour, you know, cast bronze, welding, you know, everything, you know, it was a huge foundry, really, you know, Bell brass. A, yeah, Bell brass. I could have actually done that. <laughs> he, he works in bronze. So, but, okay. um, 
I actually meant try to, I mentioned the idea of pouring a brass and we talked about it, you know, but, um, but anyway, long story short is there was a music school there called Crane School of Music. And my dad was friends with the drum teacher there. His name was James Peterzak, who ended up becoming like, you know, he's still teaching there amazingly in his 70s and is like a legend educator, taught Dave Weckl, Vinnie Caliuta, um, oh, wow. and numerous other great, great drummers at young ages, you know. And he's a famous educator for having these great hands and, and he's taught hundreds of, you know, music educators who, who went to that Crane School of Music. And so my uh, Peter Zach was a fan of art. This is the, uh, you know, probably late seventies. And my dad agreed to trade him a big drawing of a nude for drum lessons for me. And so around, by the time I was like eight or nine, I was studying with Jim Peter Zach, who's like, you know, this legend. And that's uh, so that my dad was, uh, so my, basically my tutelage was born from fine art, which is kind of fascinating. And Peter Zach still has that piece in his house, which is, pretty heavy. Is it a picture but, of you as a baby? No, no, no. It was probably big boobs and some woman or I don't know. It was probably. Go very, figure. Uh, you know, but, but, you know, drawing, uh, it was the, it was the, you know, that era where that stuff was, was, uh, you know, finally nudes were, were accessible. But anyway, um, that's how I got drum lessons and that's how I kind of got started. And I grew up in a small town. Um, and my dad also sold a sculpture, another one here that his son, um, sold a sculpture to one of the biggest publishers in music ever, Sandy Feldstein, um, who owned Alfred Publishing. It's massive. That's right. he, was, he was also a famous percussionist as well. He was in one of the first percussion ensembles. And his son, David, does a spitting image of Chris Cornell. And we did a tribute for Chris Cornell, and that's where I met him. And it was David Feldstein, and then he's a huge producer, publisher. And he owns one of the same sculptures I have that his father bought from my dad. And with that came flooding of drum books once Sandy found out when I was like nine, I couldn't read any of this stuff. But so it was all kind of like my father was extremely supportive and would um, he would go to work, teach, come home, eat dinner and then take a nap for like a, an hour and then go back to work on his art at night to his foundry. And while he was so dedicated to me being a good student because he was like a nuts art student and and because of this connection with the art that he would literally have me practice while he was taking a nap in the same room and the deal was when he woke up I still needed to be practicing so he, wow. he would sleep through me practicing yeah it was pretty nuts kind of a so yeah, my parents were super supportive and I grew up in a small town, a college town where uh, I was gigging for money by the time I was like 13, you know, wow. working steadily, playing these college events because there was just so much live music and there wasn't enough drummers to to do it. So it was great. I lucked out. And Peter Zach is still a dear friend of mine. He'll text me, you know, yeah. all the time. And, and, you know, he's a legend. So yeah, I lucked out. Thanks to my my parents for sure i had uh ron wick so on and he was telling me about auditioning for share and stuff and the story was it was really funny but did you have to audition for share uh well no yes and no I, ironically the share thing came from me doing i was doing a european drum clinic for ludwig for about i was out for about about a month all over Europe. And I was at this, I did a German festival where I demoed all these Ludwig snare drums. And one of the demo parts was I was playing brushes. And so I did like a brush demo to a jazz tune and that they, they posted that. And uh, Mark Schulman, who had been playing with Cher for the last like 12 or 13 years, amazing drummer, uh, saw that. And because he saw that, he knew that I could rock. He knew I could hit hard. He knew that he was, he'd worked with Pink, which is same management for years. And finally they had had, they were having a conflict where Pink was going to be working and share at the same time. And so he was going to have to find somebody for the share gig and hand it off probably for good. And so he saw me, he knew I could rock. He knew he needed someone for share who could hit really hard, um, but could also play very softly. And he knew I could rock. So when he saw this brush thing, he said, oh, my God, this dude could do those levels. So he called me based on that. And and that's how that's how that gig happened. So yes and no. But I would never have thought, again, a brush thing or something like that would have led me to the share thing. But to be fair, he's right. That share gig is literally like this level and this level. And you really got to be able to cover all of that. It's one of the hardest gigs I've ever I've ever done. So, you know, so that was 
But, you know, you show up and then I met, I did have another audition, which is interesting. And this is something, I don't know. Uh, it was kind of a Zen weird kind of thing, but I had met with Mark. He said, you know, this is in November. He said, we're starting to rehearse after Nam at SIR in Hollywood. Um, you should come down and meet the music director. Cause Mark was going to do like the first up through July. And then, I, then he would need a sub. And I was working with Dee Snyder. I was booked with Dee Snyder on a solo record doing all, all European, a big European tour. So it worked out perfect. And um, he said, you know, we should have a coffee. You should come down and meet these guys. Well, I had never heard back from him, they, you know, because Mark was busy. They're in rehearsals at SIR for like a month. And I reached out and said, hey, man, can I come down and have that coffee? Can we meet up and have that coffee? I'd love to keep, keep this going. And it's an interesting thing for young players or any players when when someone says like they 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 want you to do the gig, they want you to want the gig too. They're, they're you yeah. know they could maybe throw that that line out, but you got to grab it and and start reeling them in too. It's there's a responsibility. If I meet some young player and I say, hey, you sound great, I could you you know you should call me. I have a gig. If they never call me because they think they're being cool by not calling me and not bothering me, then they'll never get the gig because I need them to show me that they really want that gig. Yeah. And so this was kind of like one of those mental tests where I called Mark and he was like, oh, dude, great. Why don't you come down? We'll have coffee at the rehearsal. And I went down and the amazing bass player, Eva Gardner, who's now out with Mars Volta, who's in the original Mars Volta, has played with Pink and Cher with Mark for all these gigs. She and I are dear friends and she's on the gig. We go hiking all the time. We hang out all the time. She's on the gig at the rehearsal and there's a music director uh, there and then the rest of the band. And I show up. I meet the, the drum tech. I meet, you know, I see Mark. They give me headphones. I can watch the whole show. We have coffee. I start meeting him. I go up to Eva to talk to her. And she's giving me the, like the cold, like, yeah, yeah, dude, cool. Short answer kind of cut me off. She, and I realized this was a test. She yeah. didn't want to talk to me. She's like, talk to those guys because you're auditioning right now, dude, without playing a note. The fact that I showed up to them was very impressive. The fact that I called Mark was like, hey, man, you know, it was like, the Willy Wonka moment where like, I didn't take the, the chocolate, you know, or whatever. It was like that I had made the effort to come down there. And then I met with these guys without having to hit a note that got me the gig. So there was a follow-up audition that I didn't realize I had to prove that I actually was, I was serious about this job. And Eva being kind of like the, the cold, you know, shoulder was saying, don't talk to me, brother. I know you, I already talked, I already told him you can play, go talk to them. So sometimes you're auditioning without even knowing it. And yeah, sometimes yeah. no one's going to give you these cues. You need to like, you need to follow up. And if you don't, then you are the guy for the job. So did it's a very. Have, either one of you guys have any funny ones that backfire? They did not go well. I have hundreds, hundreds, <laughs> hundreds. Oh, I've got one. What do you got? Uh, my first audition in Nashville was with Gary Allen, and I had no idea that the lead singers oftentimes don't even show up. And I worked so hard on this, you know, Sutter, like the obsessive kind of thing, like every hi-hat opening, every ghost note, Chad Cromwell played on the records. And I really liked the songs too. I was, I was pumped. So I go in and there's no vocalist, there's no nothing. And at the time, Gary Allen was uh, People Magazine's top 50 beautiful people in the world or whatever. He was on that, that list. And so they had a microphone stand at the front of the stage at SIR. They had the spread open to his page. And while I was auditioning, they had BB guns inside of SIR shooting his picture while I was playing. And I didn't get the gig. But I oh, thought that no. was pretty bizarre. They're taking target practice at their singer who's not there and not paying attention to me at all. So Yeah. Uh, it's funny how things have changed so much from that era of when you were auditioning then. Nashville is an entirely different world. That's a whole other podcast, right? Yeah. It's like, it was the back then it was like a little tight tight knit scene and now the doors have been blown off that you know it's a whole different world you know uh it's pretty fascinating but i mean i have every every other audition was a was a, a you know there are so many but i remember one where i was trying to get um i was trying to get an audition i heard that morrissey this is like this is probably 20 almost 20 years ago morrissey was auditioning for drummers and an old drummer who played with him was Dean Butterworth. Butterworth this, yeah. this, is the, this is the story of like the craziness you go through, at least that I went through, um, where you have a spark and then you have to take that spark and try to turn it into a fire. And it's solely your responsibility. And hopefully along the way, somebody, you know, gives you some kindling, you know. But um, 
I had I had played with a band called American Hi-Fi and we toured with Good Charlotte that Dean was now playing with, okay, in 2005 on a festival. We met, we hit it off. I didn't get his number and I was trying to find Dean Butterworth and I was calling around. I called a guy named Mitch Marine who plays with Dwight Yoakam um, wow. as for a long time. But before that, he played with Smash Mouth for a while, for years. And he said, uh, he said, you know what? I, I don't have a connection for this Morrissey audition, but Smash Mouth is going to be looking for a drummer. I'm leaving to go play with Dwight. Uh, I'll give you, I'll give them your number. And, you know, they're going to be up there holding a big cow call audition. Fast forward. I finally get in touch with someone who knows I'm playing with the Rembrandts, by the way, right now. So I'm on tour with the Rembrandts in 2005, right after American Hi-Fi. They're doing their like post friends tour of casinos that went horribly wrong, which is which is a whole other story. Um, and uh, so long story short is I get the I get the audition with Morrissey, but I'm in an airport and I have to play three songs and one of them's to a track and they're going to videotape it. And send it to Morrissey. Um, at the time, I'm scruffy. I have long hair. Both those things don't work with Morrissey, which I don't know about at the time. But you got to be clean cut. You got to have short hair. Um, and I go into the audition, and I'm pumped. I, you know, you know, I cram to get this together. And because they know that I don't, I, I got the call like the day before I landed. Um, so I only had one day to prepare. The bass player is a guy who went to North Texas, and we go through this song with this guy, Boz, who was longtime Morrissey um, uh, MD. We run through the tune, they, you know, they're videotaping, we play through these songs and it is electric. I'm the first guy to show up for the day and it is like, dude, slam the sticks down, I got this gig. And Boz, the MD is just like, dude, you know, dude, killer. And he looks over at the bass player and he's like, right, and we're good. And he's like, I didn't, I didn't record it. He's like, I didn't record it. I was just throwing him out. I thought I'd give him a chance to, to run it through once because I know he just got the music and and it was just like the the air just went out of the room like it was like just it was like you've got like everyone was deflated and we ran this stuff again and recorded it and it was just nothing like the energy it was the first time oh. and obviously that's that's how the gig went and this dude thought he was growing me out and in fact that that energy was just you know it was just it was over everyone was deflated and it was like just running it like a, you know it was just it was like a sad sad sack you know so you know i've had countless you know auditions where things like that happen where you had no control over it and it and it and it worked against you you know but i think any of those experiences only make you better at at auditioning and getting over those kind of losses i don't know what you think about that ryan but to me it feels like the auditions you don't get if you leave and you can like um you can learn from them then it was still a great audition you know absolutely just, you know Ryan was uh, was Paul Rogers a fan of Collective Soul? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I got asked to play with him during uh, while I was with Collective Soul, and so uh, he got the home DVD that I played on with the 120 piece youth orchestra, and that I think tipped him over the edge. But it's it's actually a very interesting story how that came to pass. Okay, uh, you want to hear it? Oh, Jason, you got time. I'm good. All right. I'm good. Oh, we can, I mean, we can I mean, by the way, I, I'm a huge Paul Rogers fan. And I remember, Ryan, when you got that gig and we were hanging, I just like I just gotten, I think, the Cornell gig. And I remember you came over, you had a DVD, you know, that, that was like not out yet. And and I remember you playing it for me. I was like, it was just like so shit hot. It was so good. I was oh. just like, dude, it was so killer. I was just like, God, what a great gig. Like, I love Bad Company and Free. So anyway, go, I remember this time, you know, I remember yeah. Well, the, the very quick version of the story is I actually was, you know, I grew up on bad company like anybody else, but I was, I was in college working concert security at the Smirnoff amphitheater in Dallas. I nice. saw Paul, Paul Rogers live. And I, this weird little thing happened to me. I was just like, I, first of all, I was blown away. Second of all, I was like, I'm going to play for him. It was a weird little thing that happened. So then uh, after I got out of school, I started making promo packs and calling every single management company on the planet. And I would go to the, post office with stacks of these things and mail them out. And literally the only response that I got was from Paul Rogers manager, because my bio said that I came from the Pacific Northwest, which is not entirely true. I'm from Anaheim, California, but he got, he's lived in Bellingham, Washington. And he goes, Oh, you're from Washington state as well. Let's stay in touch. So I, I would send him a CD or anything that happened in my career. I would send me, him something maybe once a year. This went on for like probably a good eight or nine years. 
And then I got the gig with Collective Soul. He knew about that. And I literally got a phone call right before we were going to go on a three or four month hiatus. And he said, hey, I see you're playing in Sacramento. Uh, can I come to the show? So he came to the show, hung out with everybody. I decided to move from Nashville to L.A. I'm in the U-Haul driving all the way across the country. And I get a call saying, hey, can you be in Seattle for rehearsals in two weeks? And so I said, yes. So that's the short version of the story. Wow, I, well, never, I never knew that story. It's fascinating. I never knew it's, yeah. it's the only promo pack. Only, I mean, I literally sent out hundreds of these things, and it's the only one that kind of came to fruition. That's a good have worked. <laughs> I remember uh, one little story is I, or anecdote is I remember once accidentally I called uh, Ozzy Osbourne's management company, and actually Sharon answered. Wow. And I said, hi, my name is Ryan. I'm a drummer from Texas. And she goes, are you fucking kidding me? And I'm hang up the phone. Wow. <laughs> That's great. Man. Yeah. You're lucky she didn't sue you or try to like, <laughs> have a le press legal, you know, legal. I know, I know. I'm very fortunate. Wow. That's really <laughs> That's good. Great. All right. So uh, a lot of my friends have little kids and my friend's daughter was in fifth grade when I started this and she had a couple girlfriends over and they were into the podcast idea. And she's like, She's like, so you need to, and she was like very serious. Which so she goes, you need to ask everyone who comes on when when did they first feel famous? And so I ask each of you guys, when did you first feel famous? What event? If fame is not something you choose, a road you want to go down, and answering the question, whatever. When was there a moment in your career that was pivotal that changed things, made you feel good about yourself? Oh, for that That's question, I have by the way. I mean, so, for me, for me, it was it was I had I bought a house, I bought a, a home in Nashville, a rental property in East Nashville, which then was like a total garbage can. East Nashville in 20, 2007, summer of two thousand seven, was a garbage can. It was like just yeah, don't get out of your car, and now it's like the streets are paved with gold, and literally <laughs> the neighbor. Now I sold that house, but the house next to me is like the Cage the Elephant singer, and next to the, uh, the other side is is uh, one of the biggest songwriters in the world who plays with Steven Tyler, Rebecca Lynn Howard. And then next to me on the other side was uh, Taylor Swift's guitarist. You know, that's who lived there when I sold. But um, when I bought it, it was, it, was, it was garbage. And I, so anyway, I had this property for years and it was kind of a slumlord until it kind of caught up to be a really nice area, but I, I long-term rented. And I went back to renovate the property and, and turn it into an Airbnb years later. And I had been gigging a lot and I showed up in Nashville and it blew my mind that everywhere I went, everywhere I went, I'm lucky to have some of the best friends and some of the coolest drummers and just like, a, you know, there's like, you know, I get, I get to go hang with these, there's a whole scene there of just the coolest dudes. And when I show up, it's like, oh, we got a dinner set up, dude. And we go to, you know, a Mexican restaurant There are 20 of the coolest drummers hanging out. And I, I can say, I honestly know them and I, I love them dearly and that they let me into this world is huge. But I, to be fair, I did own houses there way before they even got to Nashville, which is pretty funny, but um, so these dudes, um, I would just, when I'm there, I'm renovating a house. So I'm there for about three weeks or whatever, overseeing this contractors and everywhere I would go, I'd just be walking down the street and they'd be like, dude, huge fan. You know, what the you know, me, you know, or I'd be like eating a coffee and guy come, like, dude, just wanted to say, you know, you know, and it was everywhere. Every show I attended, like afterwards, there were like, I would be like four or five dudes would walk up. And I, I remember one time, which was the best. I was with one of my dearest friends, Kevin Murphy. And we went to town. He was like, oh, you got to try this burger at this place. It's amazing. We got to go. And it was a little off the beaten path near Music Row, um, but like off Broadway or whatever. We're sitting there and um, I've been doing this stuff for a while now. This is, you know, later. I've been you know, probably owned this house for 10 years. And we're sitting there, we're eating and I'm sitting there with Murphy and it's just me and him. We're having a burger and it's kind of like later after, you know, it's probably like 10 o'clock. And I look over and there's another kind of bar here, scene there. And there's like a young guy there and he's got like four like smoking girls around him. And I'm like, uh, Murphy and I are joking. I was like, I remember that, man. I remember when you were young and you were like, you know, the, you know, had all, you know, the, girls and you know we we're like yeah dude yeah that dude yep yeah. well you know we were there you know and we're eating and the guy finally gets up and you know and he gets up with these girls and they're walking by our thing and he, and, and right as he gets up to us he turns and goes dudes i'm the hugest fan i've been freaking out over there i just had to say like and i was and i looked at him and i was like what is going on he's like you're in nashville dude. he's like in la nobody acknowledges that Nobody cares. And it's true in L.A. If, if you don't know this already, but you could be sitting next to George Clooney at the end of the bar and no one's going to bother George Clooney. 
No one. He's just sitting there. It's not probably not. No one can say anything to him at at the right bar. Uh, and that, that's how L.A. is. He said in Nashville, everyone is paying attention to music. Everyone, whether you live here or in L.A. or in New York or anywhere, the people in Nashville, this is a music city. They know who you are. They're they're hungry. They're paying attention. They're listening. And it was it was it was like a revelation. But that I really did feel like the most famous ever. You know, I mean, that is like it's one thing if you're in a rehearsal studio and there's a young guy. And he's like, hey, I went to Berkeley. I read I listened to your podcast or whatever. So it was it was uh, that was a moment. And that did is you take his is, girls. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we still we, we left with like two chicks on each other. We're like, uh, like loser, <laughs> peeled out the four pack. We didn't, but but the girls were like totally like ooh, like we were like a big deal. It was, it was just so surreal to be like, you know, we're envying this guy, just kind of joking, and then it turns out this dude is actually envying. Yeah, it's cool. Our, yeah, so it was just it was it was cute, you know. Yeah. So, yeah. That was a moment of like, what is going on, you know? So yeah, it was surreal. What do you answer, got? Sir? What do you no, I got, uh, well, I got two part, two part answer to that. I think okay. that I got to actually play with my, my literally my favorite band, which is Collective Soul, and got to be a band member. And I was in the studio with them for about a year and a half before I ever got to go out on the road, and I, I never even knew that would be possible. And so for some time, I was a sub on the road. Uh, playing the former drummer's equipment, everything. Couldn't even bring my own drum set out there. And, and then at some point, I was allowed to go to the meet and greets and I was allowed to interface with the, the fans and the audience. And so I was feeling pretty big. And we're at a show in Athens, Georgia. And it's this huge college town and it's just people everywhere. It's mayhem. And Ed looks at me and he goes, go out and sign some autographs. And I'm like, really? Okay. You know, I'm 25 years old at this point, something like that, 26. So I opened the door to the bus and I'm thinking and I've got a, a tiny solo cup in my hand and it's got one literally one sip of beer in it and so I go out and I'm feeling like on top of the world I'm signing this signing that and I'm just like yeah next thing I know a bicycle cop comes up and I literally get accosted by this guy takes my beer away gives me a ticket threatens to arrest me in front of all these fans that are asking for my autograph <laughs> and i literally had to go back and show up in front of a court and like i got it dismissed but it was pretty embarrassing <laughs> that, dude that's rock and roll man that's i would have just been like dude like you, you'd be signing so many more autographs after that right like oh he's the, he's the dude who gets arrested man rock he and took roll. my sip of beer away i'm just like really it's, that's you so know. keith moon <laughs> so my second answer my second part to that answer would be i think for me when i played royal albert hall with paul rogers and we yeah. literally had roger taylor walking down the hallway brian may of queen we had roger fisher from heart howard lease from heart uh playing with uh we had uh robert plant in the audience rumors were that jimmy page was there in the audience and so i'm like i'm literally playing for led zeppelin and queen and heart and uh, that was frightening. <laughs> it, was, it was something else. Th those moments are pretty surreal, like playing with Cornell. It was surreal. Like, like Jimmy Page is at the show, you yeah. know, and we're, we're playing the Astoria, which I don't even think is there anymore. And there's a balcony. And Jimmy, it was when Jimmy first came out with like the white mane of hair, like, oh, it was yeah. like 2007. And he came out and he sat at the very edge and there was one white light in the balcony only for like people to kind of go up that to the side. He was in the end seat. And so literally the only person we can see in this venue is Jimmy Page from like up above. Like he's like, oh, like, wow. like he's like floating above us, you know, like Amazing. watching us, you know. And and I just remember thinking like, I've got to play so well tonight. Yeah. Because, because this dude has played so well for me his whole life. You know, yeah. it was such a moment. It wasn't nerve wracking, but it was a moment. But I remember another cool time meeting like someone like that playing the OC Fair and Clem Burke from Blondie came with a buddy of mine. Oh, wow. oh, that's and cool. uh, he was like, you know, who's my idol growing up? You know, I just loved his style. Still do. He's, a, you know, he lives down the street and is a dear friend and uh, just still inspired by him. I go see Blondie whenever I can. And and he showed up. I'd never met him. And he showed up and he's sitting on the side of the stage watching. And afterwards, he's a massive like Anglophile. He loves like or England. Is that right? Anglophile? Anyway, he loves England. He's he's obsessed with, with England and the, the British movement and the Who and the 60s and just obsessed. You know, his dressing room before every show is just filled with British, you know, Union Jacks and posters of the Who. And so anyway, 
he subscribes to this European drum magazine, I guess. And I had just done a feature. And so not only do I meet Clem Burke after the show, but he says, hey, you're in this magazine. They, they don't publish this over here. So here, and it was like, and I probably never would have gotten this magazine if it weren't for Clem Burke. So it's like, it was just like my brain was just kind of like melting, you know, the reality of like, you know, Clem Burke handing me this British drum magazine that I'm in that he's, you know, it's just like, it was it was surreal. It was really an incredible, you know, moment. So that that when that that was one of the first times where you're playing for your peers and you're yeah. like, holy shit, you know, this is happening. You know, it's pretty amazing. Do you think Clem considers himself a Ramon? Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh, for sure. He's not just a Ramon, he's a Ramon, he's a, he's a go-go. He's, uh, you know, and he, he's been in all that or those worlds and, and he, he deserves, you know, he deserves to be knighted by all those amazing new wave punk rock icons. No question. Cause you know, when you, if you really read the, those history books, I'm obsessed with reading those, any old punk books, you know, I got to play with the New York dolls, like, you know, getting to do that. Like I do, I, I do deep dives whenever I'm playing with an artist and read everything. And Clem was everywhere, man. That dude yeah. was everywhere. You know, yeah. he's like a Joan Jett was the same thing. Like, or uh, obviously Chrissy Heimer, they're going back and forth from England and they're bringing this culture and going, you know, blowing it, you know, everywhere. Like they, they were bringing that punk rock, new wave punk ethos from England in truckloads, just in their minds, in their clothing. They brought that to, to New York City. You know, they brought that to LA. So Clem, Joan Jett, there's a whole sea of those people who were, obviously Chrissy Hine, you know, in spades, we're bringing that British movement to America, which then bounced back and kind of, you know, they were catalysts for that. So yes, he's definitely, he's I think he would definitely, you know, he definitely deserves one of the rings, you know, or whatever. He's, he's <laughs> a, he's royalty from, from that. Yeah. He is, he is what is it? The seventh Ramon or I don't know how many guys have been Ramones, but he's one of them. I think, yeah, he was the last one, right? Yeah. Pretty yeah. cool. Yeah. What do you got, Ryan? Sorry, I interrupt you. Oh no, I for, I forgot at this point. But that's a great answer, Sutter. Oh uh, yeah, no, I was gonna say, Sutter. I was gonna say. I think a pretty surreal moment that both of us took part in was, you know, many years at going to Nam uh, convention and signing autographs on behalf of the Ludwig Drum Company, and even yeah. the Peisty Symbols Company, and being yeah. standing next to Jason Bonham, and standing next to Alan White, and just you know standing in front of like Neil Peart's drum set when he back when he was with Ludwig and yeah, I mean, Bunny, those Bunny are pretty Carlos, special moments. Bunny Carlos from Cheap Trick, you know, um, you know, all these famous legendary, I mean, I met Nick Mason at a Peisty booth and at the London drum show once. He's you know, in LA tonight. He, what? He's in LA tonight. He's doing a show here tonight. You're kidding. Yeah. yeah. It was he only plays guy. the early stuff. He was the sweetest guy and he, and, hmm. and I guess he gets on a tube in London and doesn't miss a London drum show and gets on the tube alone and comes down and shows up and says hi at the Peisty booth and checks some dudes out. Nobody bothers him. It's just like, it, he was just a regular bloke, you know? And, and it was just, what is going on? Like this dude is so heavy on so many levels, you know, uh, not to mention the, you know, as a drummer, but you know, the guy is so multifaceted and fascinating character. So just that stuff is, is always amazing. Meeting those people like, you know, Bunny Carlos was one of my biggest fans in the world from Cheat Trick. You know, my first drum idol who used Ludwig drums, Ryan, you know, and, uh, I remember I, I got asked to do a, uh, it was like a Bunny Carlos shows you his, his, he has a famous in, in drum collection, like from the twenties on from Ludwig, he is the most extensive. And so it was like, I was going to do a clinic there or do like a demo thing for Ludwig. And then Bunny was going to give me a tour and it's on YouTube, I think, which is amazing. It was the first time he'd ever let anybody in with a camera into his like little man cave. Oh, I remember like, that. You told me, yeah. And, and I remember thinking like, I want to tell this guy, but I got to be careful about telling it. You know, you got to be ter careful telling someone that you're like their drum line, you know, because there are certain guys that you just know have got, probably got sick of it. You know, Neil Peart, obviously from Rush, doesn't want to talk drums, you know, that he's very vocal about that, you know. And Bunny is a tricky guy. Your Bunny, if you get him on the wrong day, he could, you know, he could just be like, yeah, I don't want to talk about that. And so we're hanging out. And finally, at one point, I said, hey, you know, I got to 
pee. Is there a bathroom here? He's like, ah, oh, you know, we can just go out. So I got to pee too. So we went out and he has a big barn and I'm pissing next to Bunny Carmen. <laughs> and I literally looked over and I said, Hey man, I, you know, it was just me and him. Finally, it was all like no camera crew, no Ludwig reps. And we're peeing. And I looked over and I just went, you know, I just got to say, dude, you're like, you're my first row, my own. Like, <laughs> so I'm telling Bunny Carlos since well, we both have our dicks in our hands. It was, it was like, I don't know. Why not? You know what I mean? You know, what, what's the worst that could happen? He was really sweet. And uh, it was, you know, I, I feel like I could call him a friend. And it was a, it, one of those moments where you just go like, wow, you know? And so I, I, I get what you're saying with the, the, the symbols, the drums, like we worship. Those I just things. picture the, I just picture you there with your willy in your hand and all of a sudden wind hits and you're like, oh, sorry about yeah, that. Sorry. <laughs> sorry, about those, sorry about those shoes, buddy. Yeah. Sorry. I'm still a fan. <laughs> but yeah, those, those, those moments are, are, are extremely surreal where you get to meet the dudes who literally with the wind beneath your wings and, and why you play the drums you play and why you, you know, those, that, that's just, to me, that's just such a, I mean, obviously it's just a byproduct. The music is what it's all about, but to get to well, be we were talking earlier, guys, that, that was like what Robert DeLeo and they were, they were to me, man, they treated me like a little brother. Cause I was so young. I was so, I was 21 or whatever. And I was so innocent. Well, those, those guys those, that were to me when, when I've gotten good graces and I felt like I was part of their little crew. And those yeah. guys are the most gracious I've ever met. And they also are the biggest dorks when it comes to, they appreciate Joe Perry. They appreciate um, you know, Gene Simmons, they appreciate the guys who came before them so much, you know, yeah. and, uh, and, and obviously those guys then in turn, turn around and say, Hey, you know, we are huge fans because look what you did with what we, you know, where we started, you guys are the ones who are, are taking this to a whole other level, you know? Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think, um, uh one of the common ones a lot is they start removing your drums i hear that all the time but yeah, yeah that was yeah that, that, yeah that was my boss he started removing my drums while i was playing um and then smashing them with like like he was like trying to literally destroy uh you know literally destroy them so that but that was an every night occurrence with with manson <laughs> you know where literally we had to like I had the bass drum set up where the pedal during the encore, the tech would have to uh, unplug the, uh, unscrew the bass drum pedal because if Manson tried to grab the bass drum and smash it and couldn't get it, then he was going to smash everything. So you had to make it easy for him to get the satisfaction of, of smashing the bass drum. So we had to make it so he could just grab it by the end. And yeah, It's like where you have that go. meal and you leave a little bit off for the flies. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, so it was basically just like yeah, it was it was a uh, chaos every night. So yeah, it was like a it was like a prank every every you know every night pretty much. Yeah. Do you guys do you have any ones, Ryan, of stuff? I've got a prank that we did within our own band that went really wrong. Um, well, okay. <laughs> and actually, it's all on videotape. Our our ex uh, one of our crew guys has it, and I'd like to find him actually. But basically, it was kind of towards the end of the tour, and you know. Sutter knows this on a tour bus, the middle section where the bunks are is completely a sacred space. It is off limits, you know? And so we were going to break that rule one night with our, with our uh, front of house guy, Jack. And he what was a very, this? This, is your this is with collective soul. Oh, okay. And so, you know, after the show, Dean and I had had maybe a couple of cocktails. And so we thought we're going to go get Jack because he's a very serious dude and he's like never having fun and he's really intense and so the tour is about to end. So let's let's really mess with them. So what we didn't know is that our tour manager, Robert, actually got on the phone with Jack and tipped him off and said, Dean and Ryan are coming after you. So we go into the bunk thing and he's in his bunk trying to rest like it, you know, super early. And we start trying to poke the curtain, you know, and next thing you know, this like sock foot flies out and he starts attacking us. And by the end of this attack, it got so brutal. Um, that literally it broke Dean's ribs. Oh, he hit me, he hit me in the head so hard, it knocked me to the ground, knocked me out for a minute. And so, uh, yeah, that was a bunk attack where we learned a lesson. Uh, don't do that because he literally kicked our ass and it was, it was terrible. And Ed's wife watched the whole thing and she was just mortified. It, it was pathetic, man. The guy kicked What was this guy's gig? Him. What was he on the crew? Uh, he was front of house engineer. Oh, okay. Tough, man. All right. We messed with the wrong guy. <laughs> yeah, don't screw with the sound dudes. 
with <laughs> with the share camp, which is pretty harmless. I mean, whatever. But the the one of the background vocalists, Jody Katz, basically did share and and, and kind of honed her skills with Trans Siberian Orchestra for for oh. years, ten years, and she basically came up with the you know self proclaimed self proclaimed she's the professional scarer. So Jody would spend uh, her half of her day figuring out where she could hide and then jump out and scare the shit out of people, you know, oh, and like uh-huh. hide. She was very tiny. So we would and there would be orchestrated with like multiple camera angles and it would be really, really like she'd be locked in a case for like a good 15 minutes. <laughs> she was like she was willing to like play you know, where there's no way that girl could be in there. And then they open the, you know, the the wardrobe case and she jumps out and, you know, and then there's like four camera angles, you know, and we had this happen numerous times, uh, just countless videos of like when somebody's getting on the bus and they walk by the bunk and then she, you know, jumps out of the, you know, so it was in there. It's like, you know, just dying laughing moments, but I I remember one other like kind of goofy, whatever is, is, um, Cornell, Chris Cornell was like a total rascal. He could really, you know, like it was hilarious. And he was always really, you know, he was, it was, went through this. But anyway, he, we, we went to, uh, we were in uh, Oslo in Norway. And I don't know why me and the guitarist Pete uh, decided that, you know, we needed to have like more flair on this tour. And so we went out and found um, black vests. And we kept playing these shows where, and so it was laughable. We both show up with our cool new outfits, you know, classic. And Cornell just died laughing when he walked in and we had realized, me and the guitarist, that we had bought the same black vest, right? Yeah. Like here we were trying to be like so cool, have our new like flair, right? I mean, as a drummer, you know, Ryan, you really got like a scarf or a vest. That's all you got. Maybe a nice necklace, maybe wrist, you know, sweatbands, but otherwise, you, you know, you don't have an outfit. That's all you got. So that was <laughs> such a big deal for us. So it was just a, a hilarious that we, we both showed up with these vests. So we both wore these vests on stage and Cornell would leave the stage uh, after for, for the encore, the band would come up first and play. And we, by the end of all these shows, we were always shirtless. I don't know why that happened, but long story <laughs> short is, we come out all shirtless and Cornell, you know, we do this big intro to like Cochise or something. I don't know. And Cornell runs out on the stage and he's, he's wearing my vest. Uh, <laughs> and he comes out and good. he looks at me and Pete are shirtless and he looks at both of us and points at the vest like, ha ha motherfuckers, you know, I'm stealing your shit. It that's was good. just like the most hilarious, like inside moment. You know, we just died laughing. We could barely. Uh, there's, this is this is another story that's just a side note, which I think is pretty hilarious. It's not really a prank, but it's it's just a classic story that you don't hear a lot. But there was a, a famous story that I've heard from a few different people where um, from the crew where the Lou Graham, you know, had his own solo career and was a you know kind of you know there was that was that time he had that like midnight blue hit you know post foreigner and there you know it's like cocaine is at an all-time high and the band comes out and Lou Graham has this leather jacket on and he uh they score like you know this giant bag of coke and Lou is like I'll take that you know and sticks it in his leather jacket right and the whole band is like you know we're you know I'm taking this we're doing it after the show so the whole band's like you know stoked to be you know have this pile of the giant bag of coke and they go out on stage and you know getting into it and he's rocking out and at one point he's like rocking and he pulls his jacket off and throws it into the crowd in like a rock moment and the entire band stops playing oh they're just like mortified <laughs> because that's it, you know? And, and uh, it was just like, I love that story. And so the nickname for him after that, because of course they never got the jacket back, you know? And of course he had no idea what he was doing when he did it. And he was just trying to pull a rock move and the band was just mo- so mortified they stopped. So the rest of the tour, his nickname, instead of being Lou Graham, his nickname was Lou's Grams. <laughs> Which I, just, I love that's that really one. I love that story. It's just so classic drug decadence, you know. <laughs> I have a I have a pretty wild, interesting story that maybe people don't know about, but it's pretty fascinating when you're mentioning Flea is um I 
I decided one day just randomly, like, I would like to have a copy of Kiss Alive, the record cover, you know, it was a huge record for me. It was one of the first records I got when I was little and it, you know, I'm, I'm still a fan of that era Kiss. And I thought, I want a copy of that. And it was the famous Finn Costello. I don't know if you know him, but he took everything from punk to XTC to Rush. The guy was everywhere. He was, a, he was an Irish photographer. Uh, he, he took everything, you know, uh, but very unknown, very understated, quiet guy. And he took everything. And I reached out. I found him online. I don't know if he's still around, but he was living in some tiny town in Ireland. And I said, can I buy this photograph? And he said, wow, I don't really sell photographs normally. Uh, and I don't really have a way to print this up, but I think I can figure something out. And, and his, you know, his price was very reasonable. And he said, I don't own that photograph. And I don't think a lot of people realize that, like, like the Aussie with his hands up on volume four, uh, Kiss Alive, and you can go on and on, probably the, the Fleetwood Mac photo behind you, those photos are gone forever. The, the, you know, a lot of times the record label, if the photographer wasn't a Henry Diltz who kept his photo, photos get sold to the record label and the record label then throw them away yeah. after they were done. And the negative never goes back to the, to the photographer. And so they're gone forever. Uh, and interestingly, you know, uh, Finn said that photo is gone. It was sold, it was given sold to the label. The label Casablanca folded. Who knows? It's thrown away. It's gone. And oh. so he sent me a bunch of proof sheets to pick the next photo before, after. You know that shot was shot in Detroit in like seventy four or something. And and then on the back, there's the famous photo of those kids holding the banner. I don't know if you remember yeah. that, you know, there's two doofy kids holding a banner in like, I think it's Cobo Hall or Cobo Arena in Detroit. Long story short is I had heard that um, Flea or not Flea, sorry, Chad, who was, you know, uh, who was around eight then uh, or 10 was a huge Kiss fan. And he had talked to his neighbor who worked at Cobo Hall and said, she said, if you write a letter when you send in your check for tickets saying you want front row seats, they'll give you as close to front row seats as they can. It wasn't like it is now. You didn't buy that. You just, whoever bought first got first seat, you know? And so he did, he wrote a little letter at 10 years old to see Kiss. Long story short, he's got the end seat like four rows back, right? And I would heard this story and I remember thinking, um, I wonder if I'll see Chad Smith in these photos because the I irony is in this photo after they shot the front, when he went to shoot the back, he just hung out and he saw these guys walking with a banner towards the front and he was trying to get the whole arena. And as they're walking closer, finally they stop and that's where he got the photo. At, you see the negatives as they're walking. And if you look, there's a baby Chad Smith sitting in C4, just like sitting there looking. And I have the proof sheet of baby that's Chad crazy. Smith as these guys with the banner are getting closer and closer. It's like this whole thing ties together. And I remember telling him that story because uh, when I was in college at Miami, a bunch of our friends decided they were going to be Kiss at this huge costume party for the music school. And so me and a bass player secretly decided we were going to be the two dudes holding the banner. And we literally made the banner and like dressed like these two hippie dudes, if you don't know it. And I told that to Chad and he just died died laughing you know but he he was you know chad's a collector of rock photography and memorabilia as well so i'm sure wow. he said he was going to try to reach out because how cool would it be for him to get one of those photos oh, from for sure. of hey this is party like a rock star podcast and i'm your host joel Today's episode is brought to you by Misha's Kind Foods. They're an LA-based small business making the world's finest non-dairy cheese on the market today. They're lactose-free, paleo, keto, kosher, perev, and 100% vegan. If you like what you see, check out the next video. If you like this video, please subscribe and like by clicking the little round button on the bottom right. To learn more about me or our other guests on the show, go to joelrody.com. You can follow us on Twitter, Instagram, or TikTok. The handle is Joel Rody. If you haven't already read my book, Memoir of a Roadie, it's now available through Amazon and paperback Kindle or as an audiobook. I hope you enjoy the show.